Hi, so before we start, a couple of disclaimers. First of all, I will be focusing on mainstream fashion rather than the iconic people. And second of all, as usual, I'm sticking to the Western fashion because I'm uneducated. So the whole idea of like men's fashion and women's fashion varied through time and it was a pretty fluid concept, you know? Those two weren't always clearly separated. For example, in ancient Rome, both women and men wore togas until like the second century when toga wearing women started to be associated with prostitutes. And when you think about it, a lot of early medieval garments are just like a lot of fabric. So if it wasn't for the details and the headwear and the facial hair, you probably would not be able to tell whether we're looking at a noble lady or a priest. <laughs> and throughout history, women would often adapt garments and clothes typically identified with menswear. Back in 1585, in Elizabethan era England, Philip Stobbs, my main man, he wrote a whole book about things that he thinks are wrong with society. So in that book, he complained about women stealing men's fashion, noting, the women also there have doublets and jerkins. As men's apparel is for all the world, and though this be a kind of attire appropriate only, to man, yet they blush not to wear it. But let's move on to when I personally think women's fashion started directly copying men's fashion. And for me, that's sportswear, and particularly equestrian fashion. Back in 1666, uh, the year of the Great Fire of London, if I'm not mistaken. Samuel Pepys, again, an icon, he wrote in his diary, he was like, Walking the galleries at Whitehall, I find the ladies of honor dressed in their riding garbs, with coats and doublets with deep skirts, just for all the world like mine, uh? And button their doublets up to the breast, with periwigs under their hats, so that only for a long petticoat dragging under the men's coats, nobody could take them for women in any point whatsoever. Which was an odd sight, and a sight did not please me. <laughs> so basically Samuel, uh, similarly to Philip Stubbs before, was like, oh, can somebody take me back to the times when women actually dressed like women? This unisex fashion is getting out of hand. We have to give it to Samuel though, that compared to the previous era, second half of the 17th century was a time when thanks to the riding habits, men and women became almost uh, indistinguishable. So this was because of the appropriation of popular men's fashion trends such as the extremely popular, and I'm gonna butcher it, exactly that, and the curly wigs and the uh, high heeled shoe, a predominantly male trend at the time. And if you don't believe me, uh, let's play a game right now where I will show you a picture and you'll have to say, is it a lady in a riding habit or is it a fashionable man? This one is a lady. This one is a man. <laughs> this one is another lady. This one is a lady. This one is a man. This one is a lady. This one is a man. And because this was also sort of around that time that horse riding was gaining popularity as a female activity, the idea that the riding habit had to be somehow inspired by formal menswear became a very long tradition and it is still actually practiced nowadays. In the 18th century, Female riding habits were still heavily influenced by men's fashions and by military uniform. Even later, when female riding habits followed the fashionable silhouette of the time, making it a less direct inspiration, the male character of the garments was still accentuated by the accessories, by the high colors, the toned down color palette, mainly black and white, and the cut. And similarly to horse horse riding, horse riding, nail. Similarly to horse riding, that was really bad. As soon as it became socially acceptable for women to participate in different kinds of physical activities, their intuition was to adapt the clothes that men have been wearing 
for participating in the same activity. For example, for sports such as hiking, tennis, golf, women wore men's style garments and accessories and they sometimes directly copied men's sport fashion trends. And a lot of these garments changed their function over time and became staples of female wardrobe. For example, sweaters and cardigans were originally associated with men doing sports. Now they're basically, they're a base of every person's wardrobe, regardless of the gender. And a similar situation happened with pants, though that was a bit more complicated. So despite numerous attempts to adapt men's pants into women's mainstream fashion, it remained a sport-related item until they became socially acceptable as everyday wear around mid 20th century. But did female fashion only draw from men's fashion when it came to sportswear? Not at all. Sometimes a men's fashion style became so prevalent and iconic and recognizable that women just went, you know what, let me try that. <laughs> a few examples of that, shirts and neckties. By the end of the 19th century, a man's necktie evolved from elaborate knots and scarves to a simple necktie very similar to what we know as a tie nowadays. And women adopted this trend. They wore it with their menswear inspired shirts. And this trend was prevalent within the working class of late 19th and early 20th century. And collared shirts worn with ties became a symbol of casual elegance. A uh, boater hat, the iconic Victorian and Edwardian style, was originally worn as a summer hat and a sport hat by men. And it took several decades before this simple style uh, found its way to women's fashion. And when it did, it basically just took over half of the year, the warmer half of the year. Like you didn't need any other hat. Threading goats. In the late 18th century, a coat that started off as a riding coat for men and went on to becoming a fashionable, comfy men's coat quickly evolved into a smart, elegant, fitted women's garment. And when worn with a men's style neckwear and high collar, it basically became very unisex. Like, it was difficult to recognize the gender of the wearer. Now, I know this is supposed to focus on mainstream fashion and like fashion in general, but I still need to mention the creative and brave ladies that just straight up wore menswear and didn't care. Uh, neither about the fashion rule nor about the society. Some of these ladies were either outcasts, like the 18th century pirates Anne Bonny and Mary R I don't know how to pronounce it. How do I pronounce her name? Mary Reed or Mary Red? How do you pronounce your name? Some of these ladies were either outcasts like the 18th century pirates Anne Bonny and Mary Red, or they just straight up created their own rules like Anne Lister. And some of these women, uh, like George Sand in the 1830s, they were either respectable because of their position and money and no one could say anything, or they were part of the artistic circles in which such extravagant behavior was reluctantly accepted. And since Anne Lister was mentioned, it is important to note that adapting men's clothing is nothing new to the queer folk. A lot of queer women through history wore men's clothing like it's nobody's business. <laughs> even though they were often bullied for it and even though it drew attention to their dangerous sympathies and relationships. Girl, you have done it again. Constantly raising the bar for us all and doing it flawlessly. And there is a particular period in time where I feel like the queerness of women in menswear somehow merged with mainstream fashion and media, and that is the interwar period. A very popular theme both in movies at the time as well as theater and burlesque shows was women dressed up as men and women behaving like men and women doing man things. And it's a thing that I believe emerged around the Edwardian period when lots of famous Edwardian actresses played male characters in male suits that were kind of fitted to make their curves show off more. And it wasn't uncommon for women to play male parts back in the Victorian period, but that was usually associated with renowned actresses playing dramatic parts. For example, Sarah Bernard as Hamlet. 
And we also know of famous Edwardian era drag kings that gained great success. Then movie-wise, there is the 1927 gay couple in the Oscar-winning movie Wings, and both of the women were clearly wearing men's wear-inspired garments. And then we also have the famous scene with Marlene Dietrich in a smoking, but it's only a tip of the iceberg because while in the postcode Hollywood such themes might make the censors upset, European cinema didn't really care, and it continued the trend, and even Polish movies from the time Time. They continuously play with the idea of women dressed up as men and being confused for men. Yeah, true, we're talking about theatrical and movie costumes at the moment, but this of course translated to mainstream fashion as well. Both before the first war and during the 1920s, we saw a rise of masculine styles in fashion. And even contemporary commentators note that women are getting boyish, you know? Fashionable ladies wore high collared shirts and knitted vests, cardigans and spats over their boots, ties and plus for pants for physical activities. And while the 1930s was a time of like hyper femininity in fashion, it was also a time when female pants became more common than ever and more socially acceptable, especially uh, in the time of leisure, for example, on skiing trips or at the seaside. And then after the Second World War, with the rise of traditional family values, the lines between female and male fashion became more clear than they were for a long time. At least for grown-ups, because teenagers enjoyed a lot more freedom when it came to gender expression, I guess. And a lot of trends from the time, such as jeans and saddle shoes and varsity jackets and uh, polos and turtlenecks could be considered unisex. A more masculine style with an Edwardian twist was also worn by teddy girls, which was the 1950s female equivalent of the teddy boy subculture. But overall, with the clear duality of the 1950s fashion, like you clearly have the male and female fashion separated, I think it's where a lot of modern stereotypes come from. Because whenever someone refers to like traditional or classic menswear, they usually mean like the ultra masculinity of the 1950s movie stars, not the 17th century just accords. Because those were stolen by women. Ugh. And whenever someone says, oh, back when women were women, they usually refer to the ultra femininity of Marilyn Monroe or the classiness of Grace Kelly rather than the relaxed style of Katherine Hepburn or the sex appeal of Marilyn Dietrich smoking. But let's get back to our timeline. So we get to 1960s and 1960s was a decade when old fashioned rules finally began to crumble and crumble a lot <laughs> because there were so many unspoken principles principles of fashion such as elegance, maturity, proportions, aestheticism, they suddenly weren't so important anymore. And fashion was suddenly a fun, creative, a bit crazy aspect of life where you could explore and express your individuality without having to worry what's proper and what's pretty, you know? Of course, a lot of that had to do with gender. Throughout late 60s and 70s, women probably appropriated more men's fashion garments and trends than they did during the whole previous century. <laughs> and it was around that time that the lines between masculine and feminine in fashion became more blurred than they ever were before. Neither the vibrant colors nor the tight cut suggested that a garment was made for a woman because men wore the same stuff. And on the other hand, you had women wearing men's suit and it just didn't carry the same symbolism anymore. It was just fashionable clothing. And I'd say it was was a time where women could finally fully access men's wardrobe. <laughs> And by the 1980s, honestly, nobody cared. Like, nobody would bat an eye if they saw a woman in a men's suit, and nobody would raise an eyebrow over a lady wearing a loose men's shirt. High fashion nowadays seems very unisex, at least here in Europe, but you still get very polarizing reactions to pieces of clothing being worn by the wrong gender. I think it's important to remember that the archetypes of what we nowadays perceive as, like, traditionally feminine, and traditionally masculine, they are something that we constructed in our heads over time. It's not like the absolute objective truth. <laughs> and weirdly, I feel like people back in the 30s or even the Victorian era were way more open to borrowing stuff from other genders than some of us are nowadays. Because they knew that it's 
a thing that happens constantly. That's how fashion moves forward. Anyway, um, these are all my thoughts on the subject and it's getting really dark outside. Like shooting in winter is such a struggle. Anyway, it's just the tip of the iceberg, but something to think about. Uh, bye.